My name is Peter Oakes from the Department of Religious Studies upstairs in the very building that you're dwelling in. And I direct the program, the graduate program in Scripture, Interpretation, and Practice. I've been happily on sabbatical this year, so I unfortunately can take no responsibility for the brilliance of this um, conference and this panel, uh, all of which was uh, organized and developed by our graduate students, who we'll, we'll name at dinner. I'm deeply, deeply honored to, uh, that, that we are all hosting Dr. Adif Nayed, Libyan Ambassador, to the United Arab Emirates, Director of the Halam Research and Media in Dubai. But before saying more about you, uh, a couple of words about Sohail. Um, we're also deeply honored to host Sohail Nakuda, uh, Research and Publication Manager at the Kalam Research and Media, editor of Islamica, and an award-winning uh, uh, editor of journals and uh, book designer. Uh, he's an associate of, of Ambassador Nayez uh, in all aspects of work, spiritual, religious, political, publishing, intellectual, um, some safe and some very dangerous, and interreligious um, work, which is both in the category of danger and safe. Um, Mr. Nakuda was also secretary of the Libya stabilization team. I want to say just a, a few highlights of the, of the work of our distinguished speaker. He has been a key religious, diplomatic, and strategic leader before, during, and after the Libyan revolution, the chief operating manager of the Libyan stabilization team, and someone who, day and night, um, is engaged in um, suffering because of, and hopefully helping to bring to a happier fruition, uh, the results of the revolution. Uh, Dr. Nayed is sponsor of the Libyan network of free ulema, a gathering of traditional leaders of Sufi and related religious movements who some may associate with non-political action, but through the work of, of Dr. Nayad, we pray, will display their political capacities in, in, a, in a Libya um, whose roots return to traditional values. In the words of the New York Times article in 2011, this is a man of God and technology trying to study Libya. A few more words about his activities. He was professor at the Pontifical Institute in Rome, professor in the International Institute for Islamic Thought in Malaysia, senior advisor to the Cambridge Interfaith Program, a fellow of the Royal Al Albayat Institute in Jordan, uh, and in his interfaith work, a key contributor to a common word. If you're not familiar with this document, just look on Google for a common word um, put out of uh, Jordan with many of the, the words and uh, um, teachings of uh, our speaker embedded in it. Uh, he's a key mentor of our own Society for Scriptural Reasoning, which originally Abrahamic, now Global Society for uh, Interscriptural Study. Um, listed as one of the 50 most influential Muslim leaders in the world. And finally, he's known as an author of a series of monographs, uh, scholarly works, religious works, works on interfaith, such books as Operational Hermeneutics, Catholic Engagement, and Growing Ecologies of Peace. But I want to speak of him finally in a, in a personal way. Uh, since most of my intellectual career, college and on, I've prayed for a chance to meet one of those medieval Jewish, Jewish, one of those medieval Jewish thinkers, like Maimonides, but there are many, who astound us when we study them because they were leaders and took responsibility for intellectual life, for religious life, for spiritual guidance, for financial dealings, often working with governments. And I didn't expect God, the answer to my prayers to come 
in the form of, of a Muslim leader. Um, but uh, Dr. Nayed is, is the person I've met in all my life uh, who fulfills that role, encompassing all those forms of leadership at a time when nothing non-comprehensive will be a source of peace. Bless you and thank you for coming. Thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulullah. Can you hear me? Thank you very much, uh, my teacher and my friend, um, Peter, for that introduction. And thank you very much to the graduate students uh, who not only organized uh, this great meeting, but also invited me to come and speak uh, on this occasion and to participate in some of the sessions that they are holding. And thank you very much for this great university. Uh, it's a great honor to be the University of Jefferson. Um, I would like to speak to you today about operational artifacts and texts, and especially scriptures as operational artifacts, and how those operational artifacts are engaged. And this will sound very, very abstract. And th the reason it sounds abstract, because it is. Because I believe that before we can talk about weaponizing scripture, which is the topic of the meeting of the graduate students here. Uh, we need to have theoretical models to help us deal with this notion of weaponizing scripture and the whole notion of instrumentalizing or utilizing scripture. So I would like to begin with a, with a, a fairly abstract introduction in which I, I would like to, to propose a model of uh, texts and especially scriptures and then a model of how engagement of scriptures happens. And then we can talk about more concrete examples of what happens in the politics of today, especially the politics of the Middle East with the rise of ISIS and, and other disturbing trends. So bear with me. I will, I will begin quite generally and then, and then we get down to specifics. Now, <clears throat> there is a very strange thing about human beings in that we often lump together activities simply because we use the same name for them. So for example, under the activity of seeing, we lump together all sorts of activities. So looking at a painting is called seeing, and seeing the traffic light is called seeing, and seeing someone passing by is called seeing. However, if you really get into it and analyze the kind of activity, the structure of the activity, you will readily see that the seeing of a work of art is very different than the seeing of a traffic light. Okay. And the same thing with this important activity that we call reading. So reading a menu in the restaurant is called reading. Reading a novel is called reading. Reading scripture in the early morning is called reading. And these, these activities are actually quite different. They may, they may look similar just because we're passing our eyes upon a text, but they're actually quite different in structure. And we often lump them together. The same thing with the activity that we call interpreting. Many things are called interpreting, just because of the use of that word. A long time ago, when I was a graduate student, and I think that being a graduate student is the most blessed state you can be in, so you should be grateful for it, despite <laughs> the suffering. Um, I, I tried to actually sort out the various ways in which we use the word interpreting, and in which we use the word reading, and try to have a typology of interpretive activities. I believe that these typologies are very important because we make category mistakes all the time, as Gilbert Trial pointed out long ago. And these category mistakes are actually quite catastrophic in many ways. There is no such thing as reading as such. There are multiple ways of reading. There are multiple activities that we call reading. And when we talk about reading scripture, we have to be precise on what we mean. During medieval times, this was quite a, a, a much appreciated fact. People readily understood that there were multiple ways of reading and multiple ways of interpreting. And there was allegorical reading, and there was uh, a, a juridical reading, and there was moral reading of scriptures. And, and people actually made uh, typologies. Uh, in the Jewish tradition, Hillel made typologies and rules of interpretation. And in the Christian tradition, the, there was the famous quadriga of dealing with the, with the text in, in, in at least four ways. 
So there were, there were attempts at, at, at making typologies of, of activities that we call reading of, of, of scripture. And this tradition continued into the late 19th century, early 20th century in the little known works of Benedetto, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Emilio Betti, who wrote a, a book which is uh, unfortunately neglected, which is called The General Theory of Interpretation, Teoria Generale della Interpretazione. He was a, an Italian jurist, a Roman law uh, scholar who made a typology of interpretive acts. Uh, again, some uh, obscure German figures before Schleiermacher, like Meyer and uh, like Ast and uh, like the Schlegel brothers, also try to have these typologies. But now, nowadays, people don't usually do typologies of types of reading. And they, they just do things like general hermeneutics or philosophic hermeneutics. This is largely the crime of Hans Georg Gadamer, following his teacher Martin Heidegger, who kind of lumps everything together into Verstehen. You know? So everything is, is understanding. And actually, under understanding for them ends up being an activity of language as such, you know, as the late Heidegger would say, and as the um, uh, as uh, Hans Georg Gadamer would say at the end of his book, Wahrheit und Methode, or uh, Truth and Method. Uh, this is a very bad trend. I, I I I think that the philologist and the philological tradition of earlier times was much better at making these typologies of of, of readings. Another point which is important to, uh, to, to make is the object of, of reading. What are we dealing with when we are reading or interpreting, scripture or otherwise? What is it that we, we are reading? Oftentimes, people think that we're just reading sentences. And sometimes there is a kind of a cognitive prejudice in contemporary times where we're thinking that we are reading with our brains or minds. So reading is simply cognition. Okay? of utterances or sentences. And I think such a cognitive approach to, to reading actually does a lot of injustice to, to scripture, to the dealing with scripture, the engagement of scripture, and it actually misses out on many activities that go by the name of reading that are not just cognitive. So what I would like to point out is the fact that texts are closer to machines and engines and and, and things like fans and, and, and drills and, and power tools than they are uh, to, to mere collection of sentences. I know this may sound weird and, and, and strange, but just bear with me for a moment. You know, if, if, I, if, I, if I walk in this world, there are all sorts of things. Some of these things are natural, and some of these things are artificial. This is a classical a classical distinction. Mind you, all the artificial things are made by natural beings, so that distinction sometimes breaks down. But let us say that it holds. And if I look at the artificial things, some of them are quite inert, like this table or this blackboard or the screen. They're quite inactive. Okay? But some artifacts we make are actually quite operative. They do things. And they do things with various degrees of operativity. For example, the light just shines. Okay? A drill just drills. An engine has many moving parts. Okay? So there are degrees of operativity. Austin, in his book, How to Do Things with Words, pointed out long ago that talk is a kind of action too. And that utterances are actually activities, they actually do things. So that in the, in the uh, uh, for example, in the uh, Muslim juridical tradition, if you say, I divorce you, it actually makes the divorce happen, okay? It's like I named the ship, this is one of the examples Austin uses, I named the ship the Queen Elizabeth, that ship becomes the Queen Elizabeth by name. So utterances do things, that was his, one of his key insights. And Cyril built on it, and this is the whole tradition of speech act theory and then pragmatics, which actually is built on that. If we take that insight and see sentences as speech acts, doing things, and see a text as consisting of these little writs, I would call them, okay? And these writs being built together, much like the 
parts of an engine put together so that it operates in a particular way, we begin to see that a text actually operates upon the reader. Okay? It actually has an operativity not only inherent in it, but is triggered through the engagement. And one of the weird things about this operativity is that it is actually well intended, meaning that authorial intention, contrary to the theory that says that the author is dead, the author is very much alive and well. And not only this, but the author's intentions are embedded in the very de design of the text and in the very preconception of how it will operate. Okay? The notion of embedded design may seem weird, like how is an, a, an, a, a, an intention of a human being de designed into and embedded into something. But in the very structure of the chair, okay, there is the intention of sitting. And in the, in the very structure of the water bottle, there is the intention of holding a liquid. Okay? And in the very design of the screen, there is the intention for to reflect images, meaning the engineer's intention, okay, the blueprint that the engineer made first in his mind or her mind, and then built into this device or thing that we are using, intentionality is already embedded. Not only this, but the engine of the car operates the way it's intended to operate, to the point where we can say that the designs of the engineers who designed that engine their intentionality is embedded in the text, uh, sorry, in the engine they made. The reason I say this is that as you're approaching a text and you're reading a text, it is not a haphazard heap of sentences, nor is it a heap or a cluster of passive sentences. It's actually operative sentences, speech acts, okay, which are put together in a clever way so that they would operate in a particular manner, right? Just like an electrical device is triggered. So if you have an electrical drill, okay, you can do various things with an electrical drill. And, 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 and let's make the comparisons with the text. You can take an electrical drill and just look at it. Okay. Appreciate it like this. The same, by the same token, you can take a text and look at it from a distance. Someone else's scripture, something that doesn't really matter to me. Someone, someone else's book, a novel that I really don't care much about, okay? I kind of look at it. And then there is another mode of dealing with an with a electrical drill. I may be interested to see if it's actually made properly. So I may take it apart. So I can actually analyze this, this machine, okay? I can take it apart. And there are lots of people who spend their whole life taking apart scriptures, a redaction, criticism, and they do like the historical background and the philological, etymological studies and so on, and they take the scripture apart. They never make that scripture operate upon them. They, they never actually see it that way. So they just work at it as an object. And there is nothing wrong with those studies. Those are very important studies, but it's a very different mode from the first mode, okay? which we may call just simple actuating of scriptures. This second mode we may call manipulating scriptures, like actually doing things to scriptures. There is a third mode of taking the electrical drill and utilizing it for particular purposes, for drilling this wall or for drilling this, this desk. This, in, this mode is actually a kind of utilizing. It's not just actuating only, and it is not manipulating the thing, it's actually using it. I believe that weaponizing scripture is of this type. It's a form of utilization, okay? But then there is a, a, a different mode, yet a higher mode of, 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 util, of, of, of engaging uh, texts and scriptures. And that is when you actually begin to submit yourself to this thing and have it operate upon you. And, the, uh, you know, the image with the drill becomes quite scary now, okay? <laughs> now, mind you, it may sound scary, but it's not. If you, if you look at monastic studies, for example, the way the, the monks read uh, the Bible, what's called Lexio Divina, okay? 
or the way Muslim sages studied the Quran in Tilaw, or the way the rabbis, real rabbis with real genuine interest in the Torah, read the Torah in cycles. As these cycles happened, they weren't just utilizing the book. They were not just doing things to it. They were not just looking at it, but they were actually being operated upon by the verses as they went through. It's as if they were passing their heart through a lathe or an instrument that was actually shaping the heart. And that's why Lexio Divina was part of the shaping of the monastic character so that it becomes the habitus of the monk. That's why Tilawa of the Quran becomes a, 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 an operation upon the heart that actually transforms the human being to the point where it becomes the very character of the person. As Aisha, the, prophet, the prophet's wife, peace be upon them both, said about the character of Muhammad, peace be upon him, that his character was the Quran. So it actually becomes the character of the person because it actually operates on the heart. Okay? So this I would actually call actualizing scripture. So from mere actuating to manipulating to utilizing to actualizing. Okay? And these are different modes. Someone who, somebody can do biblical studies all their life and never submit their heart to the Bible. Okay? And someone may read the Bible as word of God having never made the studies of, of, of pulling it apart. They know nothing about redaction criticism. But when Isaiah say, a voice cries in the wilderness, make way for the Lord, they actually find that transformative and try to make way for the Lord in their lives. That's a different mode. And the weird thing is we call all of this reading. The first we call reading, the second we call reading, the third we call reading, the, the fourth we call reading, and they're completely different, quite different. Okay? Now, so the reading of texts and the reading of scriptures is the engagement of operational artifacts. And when I say artifacts, I do not mean that they are made by man because there is a revelation, okay? But however, what I mean is that they are historically bolted together from sentences that we humans recognize as human sentences, okay? Despite the fact that they are word of God and, and the historicity of the word of God and its transcendence is a subject that we cannot uh, really get into here. Let me just su suffice it to say that we've got readings that are of different types, engagement of different types, of something that's actually quite operative. Why is this important? This is important because it can help us to have a framework for understanding what happens when we weaponize scripture. What, what happens when we weaponize scripture, as, as is being discussed in this conference, is that we are actually utilizing scripture okay, in order to impose our will to power. Okay. So it's the weaponizing scripture is the utilization of scripture to impose will to power. What is this thing about power? This is about human power, but it also has to do with divine power. And the reason scripture is so important politically is because it is so potent. It has to do with the power of God. There is a tradition in Islam that says the difference between the book of God and, and other books is like the difference between God and other beings. Okay? The potency of a book that's taken to be the word of God is of infinite power. And because it's infinitely powerful, it's quite tempting to actually try to utilize it to impose your will to power in an infinite way. And that's exactly what people like ISIS do. They take verses from the Quran and they try to impose their will upon other human beings in the name of God. Okay? And it has happened throughout history and it has happened not just by Muslims, it has happened by Christians in, in some parts of the Crusades or it has happened by some, some Jews who, who think that they're justified in pressing others. It has happened by Buddhists. It has every religion has had followers who've utilized scripture to impose their will to power using the infinite potency of God's word. Okay. And Rudolf Otto, who's a German uh, philosopher and theologian 
who wrote a, a, an amazing book called The Holy. Das Heilige, I think, is the, is the German name. And in this book, he talks about the tremendous power of God okay? and the tremendous power of the sacred and what happens as you approach the holy. People, you know, know now when we talk about God, we kind of try to sentimentalize him uh, a great deal. It, there is a lot of mushiness in God talk, especially in modern times, contemporary times. If you look at how medieval spoke of God, you will find that they quite feared God. There was an awe of God because there was this amazing power. It wasn't just compassion and love and beauty. The Muslims had this distinction between Jamal and Jalal. There were attributes of God that were of, of the sublime, the beautiful, the kind, the loving, but there were also attributes of God that were quite scary, the tremendous, the, the, the powerful, the, 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 the great will. Okay? So what we have to understand is that when you're dealing with scripture, you're actually dealing with this potency. You're not only dealing with a loving book and a compassionate book. There is a lot of potency in scripture. And you can see it in the Torah. You can see it in the, in the Bible. You can see it in the Quran. You can see it even in the Buddhist scriptures. Despite all the talk of the compassion and the love, there are many passages of almost raw power. Okay? Now what happens in dealing with this kind of raw power is very similar to what happens in dealing with nuclear power. Many countries now generate electricity which is used for households and for cooking and for hospitals using nuclear power. But many countries have weapons that are based on nuclear, uh, nuclear power. And weapons or not, what's most important about nuclear design is containment. Because if you cannot have containment, you will have dire consequences, be it in civilian reactors or military reactors or, or, or uh, weapons. Containment is very important. And there is an elaborate branch of engineering that works on how to contain radiation and how to contain radioactive materials and how to actually contain even explosions as they happen. Every tradition that has a powerful strict scripture that's, that's seen as the word of God has technologies of containment to go with it. And these technologies of containment are very important to understand and study. Part of what's happening in Islam today is that the mechanisms and the technologies for containment of the potency of the word of God are almost gone because of the deterioration of the traditional madrasas and the azhar and the various other uh, universities that used to teach the containment of the potency of the word of God, you will have basically, it's like having radioactive material that's, that's utilized by terrorists or by, by groups who don't understand how to contain it. Okay? So what I'm trying to say is, as we do hermeneutics, we're almost forgotten about interpretation control. Nobody talks about it. You don't find it in, 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 in Gadamer. You don't find it in, in Rorty. On the contrary, there is a celebration of chaos in Rorty and, 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 and some others. You know? so, and it used to be there. You know, people spoke of rules of interpretation. The rabbis had them, the rules of is Ismail and the rules of Hillel. The Muslims had them in the Usul al-Fiqh and in the various rules of, of how to deal with tafsir, okay? The, the Christians had them in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the hermeneutical rules of the, of the uh, Great Reformation. Every great reformer had a hermeneutics manual, okay? Why? Because, yes, sola scriptura, but not loose scriptura, okay? And they always had rules, all of them did. The uh, Lericos Flatios had this famous, I think, 16th century manual that became the basis for many other manuals and this tradition of containment continued. Why? Because people knew that they were dealing with something quite potent. And because you're dealing with something potent, it mattered who interpreted, how they interpreted, what qualification they had to have in order to be able to interpret, what authorization that they need in order to interpret, what are the signs of a good interpretation? What are the signs of a bad interpretation? Some of these rules are very simple. 
St. Augustine says in the Doctrina Christiana that an interpretation is a good one if it teaches love of God and love of, love of neighbor. It may sound simple, but it's very important. Imagine if we had that rule now, okay, applied to some of what's being peddled around as, as proper interpretation of the Quran or, 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 or of the Bible or of other scriptures. This is a very important rule, the rule of charity, it was called. Okay? So what's happening to us today is that part of the reason scripture is being weaponized is because it has become a loose, a loose cannon. It has become a, a open for all. This has to do with the uh, uh, abundance of literacy and printing and so on, and the feeling that if you have a university degree that you can approach any text, text at your will, that there is no need for any special training or discipline. It took many, many years, something like 20 years of training before a Muslim scholar could actually speak authoritatively about the meaning of the Quran and the Sunnah. Now kids like listen to seven videos and, and, and uh, look at seven videos and read three pamphlets and they already issue fatwas. Okay? And, and, and that's precisely the problem, is that the mechanisms for, for making sure that we end up with, with good interpretations is almost gone. It's, it has broken down. So the problem is not having dangerous texts or potent texts. The problem is, is not knowing how to deal with them. Okay? Because like any scripture, the Quran, for example, has verses that if taken out of context are absolutely dangerous. Okay? If you take them into context, and if you apply the rules, the traditional rules of exegesis to them, you, you take away that danger without losing the potency. It becomes a constructive potency. Just as a nuclear reaction can actually become a, a source of light and, and of, of energy that's useful for, for human beings rather than destroying them in bombs. Okay? So let me just go back to the very beginning of, of, of the discourse. We talked about things natural and artificial. We talked about inert artificial things and operational things. We talked about operational things having embedded design and that design including in, in embedded intentionality of operativity. Then we talked about the various ways you can approach an operational artifact and categorize it into four, the actuating, manipulating, utilizing, and then actualizing. And then we said that actually this applies to scripture. We then talked about the power of scripture and why it is very dangerous. And then we talked about containment. But we must not stop there. It's not just about power that you contain. It's actually about power that you invoke and can basically trigger in order to construct. And here I would like to invoke the notion of poesis. Aristotle makes this great distinction in the Nicomachean Ethics, Book 10. He says that the human activity divides into three. Theoria, which is kind of contemplating or looking at something. Praxis, which is doing. And poesis, which is actually making. Human beings are makers. They actually make things all the time. And if they come to any state of affairs, they try to produce another state of affairs, okay? To, to actually make, make something new, okay? So as they try to make, they invoke many things, materials and also powers to make what they make. Scripture is very important as a source for what Marx would call labor power, okay? Because scripture has potency, it can actually give the labor that you need to transform the world into a better world, to do the repair that the great rabbis of Judaism and, and the great, and the great uh, theologians of the Renaissance and the great theologians of Islam spoke about, this islah, mending the world, making the world better. How do you make it better? You need various materials and you need power to do this. Scripture has that power, but it needs to be harnessed in a constructive way. Just as scripture can be harnessed in a destructive way, it can definitely be harnessed in a constructive way. How can we have a poetic exercise today, a poetic in the general sense, not of just poetry, but poesis, okay? Poetic in that sense, of making a better world, invoking the power of scripture. Okay? How do we do that? 
I think that the, the, um, one of the key answers is community and communal work. And this community is not to be conceived of something narrow, but of something that actually comes in rings. Okay? So one's community, like even in one's little village or town, is definitely a, a place where one can work with scripture to make a better world. But then this community falls into a bigger community of a particular religious tradition. So a small local church may belong to the Anglican tradition and then the Anglican tradition belongs to the Christian tradition and so on. And then the Christian tradition belongs to the Abrahamic tradition and so forth. Again, in Islam, you may have a, a small uh, Maliki tradition in a little village that belongs to the Sunni tradition, that belongs to the Islamic tradition, that belongs to the Abrahamic uh, and, and so forth. Community is very important. Isaiah Royce, many years ago, great American philosopher who, who was one of the earliest people to recognize the, the, the incredible importance of, of Charles Sanders Peirce, wrote in his latest works, like the, la the last works in his life, especially his book on the, the question of, of uh, Christianity, uh, uh, sorry, the problem of Christianity, that's not the question, the problem of Christianity. <laughs> Uh, he wrote about the, this great community okay, and the community of interpreters. And he took that from Peirce and, and the semiotics of Peirce. We need to work on this community and the community of communities. And part of the great things about scripture reasoning, and, and I, I have been greatly honored to have worked early on on uh, scripture reasoning with Peter Oakes and David Ford of Cambridge and, and, many, and, and Basot Kushul and many others. And I, uh, because of my many occupations, I have been a very lousy participant. They give me a lot of credit where, you know, I, I hardly show up for any of the meetings. But <laughs> anyway, when I do, when I do show up, I, I feel the sense of, of a community of communities that can actually uh, uh, help build a better world by realizing some very important things. One of them, the importance of friendship and, and human communion at, a, at, a, at a, a, a deep, personal, loving level. You know, in the old days of hermeneutics, like during the Romantic period, for example, like in the writings of Frederick Ast and, and uh, Schlegel and, and even Schleiermacher, this was understood, the importance of, the, of, the, of friendship for interpretation, for understanding. It's very important to have these friendships. And these friendships that develop as you work on scriptures together from various traditions is, is very, very important as a corrective to the madness that's happening in the name of religion today. Why? Because once you have a single Buddhist friend who's very close to you, you will have a very difficult time hating Buddhism or Buddhists. Once you have one Christian friend, one Jewish friend, one Muslim friend, who's really appreciated at a personal level, each time you want to make a, a statement of hatred or prejudice, you remember your friend and you will feel ashamed of yourself. This is very important because it's a key. It's a hermeneutic key to understanding the scriptures of others and the traditions of others. You must have personal friendships with those others. Second point, which is very important, is networking and the network of networks. The network of networks, which is the internet, is very important for us, but we need to develop other networks of networks of traditions of people who care about scriptures and the various traditions about about thinking about culture about the truth about beauty about goodness and and this networking gives us a kind of robustness in the collectivity of the network you know the, net, the internet doesn't go down even though various servers maybe thousands of servers every night go down but the internet doesn't go down why because it's massively networked that's an engineering term. It's massively networked. So that because it's so networked, none of the nodes, you know, even if they go down, will bring the whole thing down. We need, in the face of this darkness that's actually spreading, and, and I mean the, the darkness of not only ISIS, but hatred that's actually spreading all over the world in various pockets of conflict and, 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 uh, and, and uh, great human suffering. In order to counter networks of darkness, you need networks of light. You need a massive network of networks of enlightenment and of light and of people who appreciate each other. Third thing which is extremely important is this 
rule that I mentioned uh, that August, Augustinus talks about in the Doctrina Christiana, the, uh, the, the rule of, of charity, which is actually present in every single one of our traditions. Okay? This, this what's called Rahma in Islam, compassion. Okay? It's in the Buddhist tradition, the Muslim tradition, the Jewish tradition, the Christian tradition, in the Hindu tradition, a tradition, and yet we're not invoking it enough, even though it's so central. We need to have interpretations and readings that bring forth more compassion in the world and reduce the suffering and the cruelty in this world. You know this judging by the fruit that Jesus speaks about in the, in the, in the, in the Bible is extremely important. Fruit is very important. You know, the consequences of an interpretation. If an interpretation and, and the reading increases cruelty and violence and hatred and, and destruction, it's definitely a bad interpretation. Okay? If it increases goodness and compassion and love, it's a good interpretation. And lastly, and this is a very important point, which we often forget, it's very easy to think that you're doing things as you interpret, that you're following a methodology, okay? and that the act of interpreting is a, an act, a human act. There is something about Holy Scripture in the various traditions, and you can see it in all the sages and their writings in the various traditions, that says that despite the fact that Scripture has a lot of potency and power and so on, that the true approach to Scripture that is most fruitful is the one that is powerless, that actually is based on incapacity rather than on capacity, that is based on humbly giving the heart to that efficacy that is coming from God as he speaks to us in his various scriptures. And this is how can we develop a methodology of not self-imposing. <laughs> and uh, the great uh, hermeneutical manuals of the Reformation often began with, with the, uh, 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 the first rule was, it was called the rule of the invocation of the Holy Spirit. And in, in uh, Islam, there was a small dua that all teachers, as they taught books and they tried to give exegesis, would make. And in the, Jew, the Jewish, the, the Talmudic tradition, there are similar prayers where you're asking humbly, with total powerlessness and incapacity, for enlightenment from God himself as you read. We are not reading dead books of a dead being. We're reading living books of a living God. And this living God still inspires and enlightens, but has to be approached with the most humble of attitudes. And that is often forgotten in the great methodologies that the human beings put forth. With this, I conclude my remarks, and I hope that they weren't too abstract or confusing. <laughs>